Yay! I'm seeing people <laughs> as a librarian. We've missed you desperately in the library. If I have to shelf read another section of the library, I might just kill myself. So thank you for coming back and giving me something different and exciting and enjoyable to do. Um, the library will be expanding hours as of June 1st. We're gonna start, we're gonna almost be back to full schedule. Starting June 1st, we'll be open six days a week, Monday to Saturday, and it'll be 10 to five. We're down some staff right now. We've had a couple of folks retire. We've got somebody out on maternity leave, uh, as well as we do not have access to the wonderful college students who yeah. do their job stuff. When you get a second, I, it keeps logging into you. I can't get oh, yeah. out of so yours. Gotta... Log out of me, okay. sign out, and then it should ask you to oh, use another right. account. Um, so um, we're just, we just don't quite have enough staff to cover everything. But I believe that on uh, June 1st, we are gonna be, or July 1st, we'll be back to normal. I'm all set. I had a problem, but I got it solved. Um, so uh, as of July 1st, I believe we're gonna go back to our normal full evening, full on hours. Uh, Andrea is, has just completed the Master Gardener program through the UVM Extension courses and is very kindly offered to do the volunteer hours that are required after you go through the courses here for us. I think she's also doing some other things. She'll probably talk a little bit about it, but I'll tell you how this came about. I'm interested in bees, and uh, it occurred to me that our summer reading uh, theme of this year, Tales and Tales, made, it made sense. So I started looking into some different things and reached out to Barbara Blodgett, uh, the Middlebury Garden Club person and I said hey does the Garden Club want to do this and she said we're really busy but I got this great person here who I think she's a member of the Garden Club anyway she's just finished the master's program why don't you reach out to her and lucky for all of us she said yes so not only did she say yes but when I said I'm interested in bees and gardens uh, 20 minutes later she had at least four programs worth of information oh, laid out. So we've, we've uh, decided we do two programs. So this is the first, and today she's gonna talk to you about native pollinators, why they're so important to us, why we want to give them what they need, and what it is that they need, and how we... And this is gonna be the easy to do version. In August, she's going to come back and she's going to talk to you about what you can do to plan and create a permanent perennial garden that is good for native pollinators. And it'll have all the things they need, which she'll talk to you more about, but everything they need, shelter and water and food and the whole nine yards. So I'm really excited. I'm coming back to that one with Notepad because that's my plan. So um, I'm very excited that she decided to do this. I think that we're all very lucky. While she's getting, oh, we're almost there. I'll say if you didn't already know, the front of the library has a completely different look. The garden club gave us a grant and they redid the whole front garden. The, the flowers that were right on the slope were just so really difficult to maintain they removed those re repurposed the plants i'm not exactly sure where they went but it wasn't the garbage and they uh put grass seed there and there are beautiful plantings on either side of the front step so i encourage you to take a peek just know that they are not complete some of the plants have not come in yet okay how are we doing i'm trying to get this pan. okay where does it go all right, now let's move this over so that you can be here. Where does this go? I'll be right there. Okay. 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 Okay.
technology. Oh, yeah. Keep technology. I'll be Right now, I think. Yep. Me too. Gosh. I can't tell you the number of times I'll say we okay, need Okay, sorry about old. all the technical difficulties, folks. But now we are ready. Thank you for coming. Do you mind if I don't wear... Hi, Mary. Do you mind if I don't wear my mask? Do you mind if we don't? I don't care. It's up to Renee. Yeah. Well, the library policy is you have to have it on. So as much as we all are saying we don't mind, you still have to wear it. Sorry about that. Can we and have I hate being the person to tell you that, but yeah. that's what I have to say. Good. Because I would like yeah. to not uh, have my shield on. Yeah. Now I we do have another shield. I do not. I'm sorry. There we go. Yay, we're live here. Okay. Finally, everybody, thanks for coming. Thank tell you a little bit about uh, our native bees and pollination. Um, this is what we'll go over. I'm going to just give everybody a refresh on what pollination is, um, why bees are really, really great pollinators, talk about our native bees and three really simple things you can do to help them out, um, how to attract them to your garden using annuals, and then how to control pests but don't hurt the pollinators, uh, and then hopefully we'll have time for question and answer, though we'll see now we're getting off to a little late start. So. Stop me if I am starting to talk too fast, just because I'm trying to catch up. But pollination, it's, it's basically getting the pollen from the male parts of the flower, the filaments, and getting that pollen uh, over to the stigma of a flower, and then a pollen tube forms, and that um, genetic material goes down into the ovary and, and fertilizes and becomes seeds. So that's the basic premise. Now there's two types of pollination. The first one is cross pollination. Oh great. The first one is cross pollination. That's your bike. Uh, I'm sorry, the first one is self pollination. So self pollination means that the pollen from the, the male part of the flower goes to either the same flower stigma or it goes to the, uh, a flower on the same plant. So it's exactly the same plant. It's the plant pollinating itself. And the example I thought of right away is I have a apple tree sitting there, wild apple tree. It's all alone. There's no other apple trees anywhere else. And I walk by and it's buzzing with bees all, all spring. And that's just a bee going from flower to flower to flower to flower. That's all being self-pollinated in essence. Whereas cross-pollination is when the uh, pollen from uh, a flower goes to the stigma on another flower of the same species but a different plant, right? So one sunflower, the bee picks up some pollen, goes to another sunflower, and then the pollen goes on to the stigma, the female part of that flower. It still has to be the same species of plant, right? Or else we'd have We'd never have plants breeding true. They'd all be totally different every time <laughs> seeds came, uh, grew up. So they do have a means, flowers have a means, a mechanism where they can reject pollen that lands on them that isn't from the same species, okay? And some plants, some flowers can even prevent self-pollination. So they force genetic diversity happening. But most flower, most um, plants allow self-pollination too. So there's two ways. How does the pollen get from the male part to the female part? Wind is one way that definitely uh, happens quite a bit. And I think of corn, right? You, you can't grow corn in one long, long row because then you have to make darn sure that the wind's going to blow up and down that row or you're not going to get any kernels of corn. Uh, however, you plant it in a block and then you know that there's going to be enough wind and the wind moving around different directions where you're going to get good pollination happening. And then, of course, the other way that happens is with pollinators, some animal taking the pollen from one uh, flower to another flower. So, pollination, why does it matter? 80% um, of the world's crops uh, that are grown for human or animal consumption, uh, specifically, uh, require pollinators to actually make them happen. And uh, up to $10 billion of uh, U.S. revenue um, generation is due to pollinators who are making all of that food for us and bringing it to our plates. And I thought this was interesting. Half of the fats and oils for human diets come from plants that need to be pollinated by pollinators. So, um, uh, you know, coconuts and palm oils and things like that 
um, avocado, they, they need the pollinators. And the other thing is biodiversity. If we didn't have this sexual reproduction, um, plants could only uh, reproduce by propagation. You know, like a, a raspberry plant sends up a runner and then that's just itself. It's still the same plant. So there's no genetic diversity. So having the, the um, action of pollinators on our plants really leads to having that biodiversity. And I love this image of, you know, your breakfast with bees, your breakfast without bees. It would be pretty sad. So who are the pollinators? Well, birds, hummingbirds, I think we all know that. This other bird is from Hawaii. It's an Iliwi. It's got a really long, uh, strange shaped beak that it pollinates a very specific type of flower in Hawaii. Mammals, I think when we think of mammal pollinators, we think of bats. We'll, they'll um, pollinate flowers that are especially, they've co-evolved with them to open at night. But there's also um, some little shrew down in southwestern United States that is a key pollinator. Um, and uh, in Madagascar, I found this, there's a lemur that is required to do some pollination in Madagascar. So that's very interesting. And then even reptiles. So there's geckos and lizards. Um, these are mostly in Asia and in Australia and New Zealand, and they are very important uh, pollinators in those places. But, of course, insects do the bulk of the pollination. And the pollinators in the insect uh, family uh, range from the ones we love to love, like butterflies, and then the ones we love to hate, like wasps. <laughs> and in between, there's beetles. Uh, flies even will pollinate, uh, moths also, and then um, uh, ants. And I don't know, does anybody know um, wild ginger? Has anybody ever seen wild ginger growing? I was out on a walk there, I saw it for the first time. We were on a naturalist walk and they were teaching us how to identify wildflowers. Beautiful leaf, isn't it? I mean, it's amazing, heart-shaped leaf if anyone hasn't seen it, all over the ground. And then she said, okay, well, what about the flower? And I go, well, there are no flowers. There are no flowers. Ah, the flowers are down on the ground. They're very interesting, yeah, really interesting shaped flowers. They actually sit on the ground, way under the leaves. It's because an ant pollinates them. And so the ants just crawl in and go to the next one and crawl out. So I found that interesting. But of all the insects, the best pollinators are the bees. Okay, and I'll go into why that is and why we should care about them. And I don't know if you can all see that little tiny bee picture, but it's covered with pollen grains. It looks so cute. Amazing. And when we think of bees, what do we think of? Honey. Honey. We think of honeybees. Well, yeah. Are honeybees native? No. No, they came from Europe. So there are honeybees that are native to Africa and also to um, Asia. But in the Western Hemisphere, there were no honeybees, okay? None of our bees are honeybees that are native. Um, but of course, the Europeans wanted to have their honey, so they brought the honeybees over with them, brought the hives. The interesting thing is, um, well, we all know they're highly social, right? We all know they live in hives, the queen and the workers and the drones. I mean, we've all learned that many, many years. Most of native bees, however, are solitary. There's a few that will form social networks. Um, they tend to be relatively small, maybe up to 200 bees, nothing more than that ever. But the vast, vast majority of them live their life alone. The females just tend to their own little hive, and I'll show you some pictures of that. The honeybee, the honeybee that we know here and in Europe, it's one species, Apis mellifera. It's the only bee. It's all the same bee. Anytime you see a honeybee anywhere, it's the exact same species, all right? Which is why it's so susceptible, along with its social habitat and, and nature of living together, very susceptible to disease, right? The um, collinator, uh, colony collapse syndrome that's been going on with bees, um, that's terrible. Of other kinds of bees, there are 20,000 species over the, uh, across the globe. And there are 4,000 in, in North America. And in Vermont, there have been documented 316 confirmed to happen right here in Vermont. And I think we all suspect there are a lot more. It's just we haven't been looking for them long enough. Nobody's paid much attention to them until recently. So I think we're going to find uh, a lot more as we go on over the years. And I'll talk about that a little more too. And, you know, honeybees, everybody's helping them out, right? I mean, there's a lot of research going into colony collapse syndrome because there's a lot of industry around that. They're used and shipped around to pollinate a lot of crops. 
Um, so they're very important. And the native bees, nobody's been paying attention to them much. But that's changing, hence why you're all here, which is wonderful. And I think we're really starting to, um, we're gonna help out our other bees because they are declining. And why are native bees better pollinators than honeybees? Because I really want to convince you of this fact. I, I'm not against honey. I think honey is great and honeybees are great. But they are two to three, and this has been scientifically studied, two to three times better at pollinating than honeybees. And here's some of the reasons why. There's lots of different species, so they're all different sizes and shapes. And just like you can think of, you know, that alewi bird that had that bill that can get in there are certain that flowers come in all different sizes and shapes well honeybees can't get into all the flowers they can't get to that where the pollen is whereas our native bees have co-evolved with a lot of these plant species and are really adapted to being able to get at the pollen um, in all of them and they're also more interested in the pollen than honeybees honeybees collect pollen they do they store it in these cubiculi on their thighs um, and just like other bees do, but they're mostly after the nectar because that's the important thing to them is the nectar. Not all um, flowers even make nectar, so honeybees aren't even interested in them. Um, they, whereas uh, native bees, really, really, the pollen is very important to them and they're always wanting to collect that pollen. They buzz more, they're bigger, they're hardier. Uh, honeybees will stay in the hive if it's rainy or cloudy or cold, but our native bees will go out. And I'll talk about one of them in particular in a minute. Um, they'll go out in the rain, they'll work longer hours, okay? I mean, this has all been documented. It's really true, they're, they're much m better workers. Um, and the co-evolution I've talked about. I have two examples here that I really like. The top one, and if anybody can tell what that is, it's a tomato flower. And where are tomatoes native to? North America. We brought them back over. I mean, it's amazing. You think of tomatoes, you think of Italy. But, I mean, there were no tomatoes in Europe until um, we brought them, uh, they were brought back over by the Europeans. And tomato flowers don't produce any nectar. So honeybees don't even care about them. Um, and they also, tomato plants can, can pollinate with the wind, but the wind has to resonate at a very particular um, frequency to actually dislodge the pollen. The pollen's really tightly held in tomato plants. But we have native bees, bumblebees are great at pollinating uh, tomatoes. They're, they're tough, they're rugged, they get in there, they buzz around, they release all of that pollen. Actually now that tomatoes are being grown a lot in greenhouses, they're bringing bumblebee colonies in. They're, they're bringing those bumblebees into the greenhouses so that they get good pollination of the tomatoes. The other one that I love is the squash beetle. And guess what? Where are squashes native to? North America. They weren't in Europe. So this is also an instance of co-pollination where you have, there's a class of bees that are actually called squash bees. And those bees get up very early in the morning when the flowers open. The, the honeybees are still in their hive. So you've got those nice big squash flowers open. That's when the, um, uh, the squash bees go in and pollinate them. And if anybody harvests flowers to make zucchini, you know, you, you, you bread them and you, you always want to make sure sometimes the male bees will overnight in the squash buds. So make sure you give them a little tap before you go in and grab them so you, you don't get stung um, accidentally. And there's a lot more native bees than there are honeybees. I mean, even before colony collapse syndrome, there's always been more of them. I just think we just didn't look for them. We didn't know they were out there, but they are declining, which is why they need our help. So this is interesting. This is a study out of Vermont and then an, a study out of um, New York on, on blueberries and apples. Oh, that was, I'm just gonna go back up. Page up. Uh, this, this in the lower uh, uh, side, left side, that, that base, I mean, can anybody tell what flower that is? That's blueberry flowers. And I don't know if you've looked at a blueberry flower. They are really tight. They're, they're like globe shaped. The opening is super tiny on them. Honeybees can't get in there. Okay, it takes a really strong bee and it takes our native bees to pollinate blueberries. Or there's also a carpenter bee that is a nectar robber. And they come in and they are so they can actually cut a slit down the bottom 
of the flower bud, of the, of the bud there, and they go in and they steal the nectar, but they don't do any of the pollinating because they haven't gone in the right way. And they, and they eat your cows. Yeah, they do. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's why we need to give them other nests so we don't have to have them eat our house. <laughs> but they're good. They're, they're good bees. So you can see how many of the bumblebees are important in, um, in our visiting Vermont blueberries. And then uh, the same thing, wild bees with apple trees, very important um, in how much you actually get seed set and pollination happening in apple trees versus just with honeybees there. Can I ask a question about yes. that? Um, so I, I used to live in Shoreham in the middle of a bunch of apple orchards and they always brought beehives in and because I didn't know anything about it, I assumed they were honeybees, but maybe they weren't. No, they probably are and they will, they will pollinate to some degree, but they're just not as efficient. Right. And, for the, and why this study was done was actually because they were worried about the colony collapse syndrome happening and not having honeybees to bring in. And, and what they found was you don't need them as long as you make sure you're supporting and helping their native bees, you're going to actually do better, you're going to be better off. So it's not like, the, it's not the same as the the blueberry example where honeybees just can't even get in there like you know it's it's more of a the native bees are actually much better to pollinate apple trees and because they live solitary lives you could never bring them in like you do honeybees you you can so, I, I said some of the native bees are social yes so i'll talk to you a little about bumblebees bumblebees in particular and they're actually i have a whole book i didn't bring it with me about um you can grow, uh, get your own colony of bumblebees going by finding a queen and you set the queen up in a box and then you give her all the right things to let her have a, a, a colony and, and kind of grow a bumblebee co colony if you're so inclined. I'm not there yet. I like the bees, but <laughs> I'm not going to go that far. What was the middle kind of bee there, uh, bumblebees and then I That was a squash bee. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's it's any it was any it was it was contrasting any type of wild bees. So it was could be any one of those four thousand. Well, I don't know how many so New York has. Pale blue thing just says other bees. Oh, I'm sorry. On this side, yes, it's other bees, bumblebees, other, other, bees. other native okay, bees, and it. then that nine percent is I the honeybees. Yeah. No, curious. sorry. Okay. Thank you. So threats, why are they declining? These are theories, but they, they make a lot of sense and there's some good um, research going on now. The biggest problem is the fragmented uh, habitat. Like, like everything, with all of our wild animal species, we know corridors, animal corridors. Here, you know, a big wide sloths of, of lawn are just deserts for bees. There's nothing there for them. Um, so they, they can't get to where they need, where they can live and have habitat to where they can feed. Um, we've just uh, broken that up too much for them to really survive. And then pesticide use. The neonicotinoids, definitely a bad problem. I think we all know that. Um, so we're starting to really curb that back so we're not harming all of our native, and not just the native bees, other uh, very beneficial insects to our, our environment and to our gardens. Loss of food sources, invasives are one thing. The invasives outcompete the native plant species. You know, this is similar to the monarch butterfly issue with if we don't have um, uh, milkweed, which I'm glad I see growing here, uh, for the baby caterpillars to grow up on. We're not, we don't have monarch butterflies. Well, there are a lot of uh, bees that require certain species of plants. Uh, flowers as well, so that's a problem. Pathogen spillover, there can be a, a chance that some of that, um, the fungus and the mites that cause the colony collapse can get into our native bee population also, although that's a mi more minor one. And then climate change in general, what about the timing of when the bees come out and when the flowers bloom? Um, we have that kind of mismatch, similar that we have in birds when they're migrating too. So. These are a little bit of the reasons why we should start paying attention and helping the bees out. So native bees, here we get to them, 90% of them are solitary, okay? They'll mate, they'll, they'll come together, they'll mate, then the males die and the female goes off and builds her nest. And the majority of them are in the ground. So this is another important thing to remember. Um, they build their little uh, 
I don't know if you could see that up in that top picture, but they'll put the little eggs in, in different places within the ground, and then the larvae will grow, and they'll come, and that's where they're bringing the, the pollen and the, the nectar, mostly the pollen for the babies. Um, the ones that don't nest in the ground are the ones that are nesting in logs and abandoned burrows, or um, we'll see later uh, hollow twigs of plants so they find other places to actually um, to live. It, the social bees, uh, there's a number of bumblebees as I mentioned and also some of the sweat bees, I haven't mentioned those yet, uh, that will actually form loose colonies, right? Um, There'll be multiple generations going on. There might be up to 200 bumblebees in a really good uh, social environment. You can see it down there. That one in the bottom is in a nest. It's like an old bird's nest or mouse nest or something that the, those bumblebees um, and each of those little balls or inside of them is one of the um, eggs or a pupa or larvae growing. Their home range, it depends on the size. So the smaller the bee, the, it can't go as far. A big bumblebee can go pretty far, can actually go miles from its nest to find forage. Um, but about 300 feet, they say, if you want to have a place where they can nest and live and a place where they can uh, get nectar and pollen. Yeah, that's, that's a rule of thumb. Okay. I think I was going to ask a question here. Oh, here's our bump. So who are our, our native bees? Bumblebees, I just love bumblebees. Um, multiple, multiple species. The genus is Bombus, which is a really great name too, so that's cool, the Bombus. Um, and they're the fun ones. I mean, we all love bumblebees, and they're really, really good hard workers. Uh, carpenter bees, like we talked about. I know we don't like them. Um, mining bees, you can kind of tell they mine into uh, the ground. There's, uh, I love this name, the wool carter bee. Isn't that interesting? And I, I didn't look it up, but I would assume it's because I bet their nest looks like wool, all right? Because there, another one is the um, cellophane bee, and I know that's because the nest looks like a cellophane-y material. So Mason- Carter as in C-A-R-D-E-R. -E yes, so like a, okay. exactly. Wow. Yeah, oh yeah, as you're knitting, you know that. Yeah. There you go. So that should be your bee, <laughs> the wool carter bee. Rather that than the carpenter. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, the leaf cutter bee, I don't know if, you, if you've ever seen a, there's a be leaf cutter beetle too, but if you ever see um, a nice perfectly round lesion on a leaf, it's because they've come and cut a perfect little circle because they use that circle of the leaf then uh, to plug up the hole where they have their baby, their, their egg or the larvae behind it. So, you know, if you ever see uh, on a leaf, that's a good thing. So that kind of damage, don't treat that plant with uh, pesticides or anything because they don't take much of the leaf. The leaf will be fine, the plant will be good. Sweat bees, these are really cool to look at. They're bright, metallic, shiny. I actually saw them the other day in my, in my garden, which was wonderful. And you know, a year ago I would have thought, oh, that's an interesting looking fly. Because they're metallic and they're about that size. They're relatively tiny for a bee. And there's even tinier bees. Uh, we'll go fast. Cellophane bees, longhorned bees, uh, resin bees, uh, neighborly nomads. I, I really love that bee and it doesn't even look like a bee. All of these images are from the Wa Vermont Wild Bee Survey. So this is something, it's a great website. If you see a bee and you don't know what it is, check out this website. Um, it's, it's citizen science or community science. Um, great photographs, a lot of good information, and you can start clicking uh, bee photos and, and uploading them to this. So it's a really good service. And this is where they found the, the, the 316 documented bees from things that people have, uh, photos that people have sent in. So what can we do to help them? Three super easy things. Uh, it's the things that everybody needs. It's, it's water and habitat and food. So water, main thing is it's gotta be shallow, right? I think we've all seen bugs floating around in pails of water or something that they can't get out of the water once they've fallen into it and their wings have gotten wet. And you wanna change it uh, about twice a week and that's for mosquito control more than anything. The absolute fastest a mosquito can go from an egg to a mosquito that can bite you is four days and that's under completely optimal conditions 
usually takes more like a week to 10 days. So you're safe. You're not going to be breeding mosquitoes with the, st with the shallow still water. They'll drink out of puddles. I know I've seen that frequently, you know, honeybees on, on puddles. Um, so a nice, easy way to do it is if you have a bird bath or even a pie pan, one of those cheap tin pie pans, throw some rocks in it, put some water in it. Okay, and the, the rocks should still stick up out of the, the top of the water. Um, the one well, by the like light on the rock, and they, they, they will land on the rock, yes, and then, take and then they'll dip down and oh, sip into it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly, Mary. Um, the one with the rain gutter, I have a problem with that one. I thought, oh, that's cool, that's right, it's, it's got rocks in that, but if it's raining, they don't need us to provide the water. You really have to think of this. When it's we've got a drought and when it's not raining, please put some water out for the poor bees because they really could use it. Um, the other one, hydro station, it's like a concrete with a mason jar on top. That's a, a DIY one I found on YouTube. And now this is really crazy. There's, uh, I, I'm, I put this in initially, I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is $49, you can get this little glass globe that's got pieces of glass, you know, melting it, when they formed it. So it's sticking up and it catches rain, $49. I thought that's absolutely ridiculous and absurd. But it made me realize that's great that people are thinking of this, yeah. that they're marketing this and that there are people out there buying this for their garden, great. But that's good. It means that we are starting to think about our native bees. So I kind of came around to not such a bad thing if you want to do it. I never even thought of water. I mean, I put a bird bath out yeah. for the birds. And I change it when the water starts to look yucky. Yeah. But it will be so easy for me to just put some stones in it instead and change it quite for Exactly. Well, and now that I know that to do it four day, every four days. Yeah. Yeah, because you don't have to. Then you don't have to worry. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're not going to create any anything. Habitat. Jane Sorensen. She was the adjunct professor at the UVM Extension, the Master Gardener course. I also took a three a three module uh, pollinator course from the Extension. That was wonderful. If you're interested, I, I would encourage that. Uh, it does cost like thirty dollars. Um, but she's she's absolutely wonderful. She's really the one who got me passionate about the bees and pollinators patch of land this is what she says <laughs> you just want a patch of land within 300 feet of lovely garden and flowers um, and what you want is bare ground so don't cover every bit of your garden with mulch leave some bare ground there uh, you want rock piles and wood piles and leaf litter um, a grassy field too again because if you have a nice native grass that's going to be cool for them they can go in there uh, and they'll dig down because that will be bare ground underneath the grasses and they can nest in there also and then that other image is hollow um, stalks so there's a lot of native shrubs and plants that have a hollow stalk and then they nest in there and I actually have uh, this is stem nesting beetles so you can actually see uh, what they like and how they, how you can leave, you should leave them up. You don't want to cut that down. So the great thing about this strategy here, oh, so this is that, um, it's, it's great for the bees. So you're providing them with shelter in the summer, you're providing them with a place to overwinter, and you're providing them with a place to nest and raise their young. And it's easier on you because you're leaving everything messy. Don't clean up the leaves. Don't cut down the sedum stalks. You know, let, so let everything guy, be there. You know, I have a huge patch of echinacea. You, what, Mary? Echinacea. Oh, yes. And I usually, around now, when the new ones are coming up, I cut off the old ones. So leave them there. Leave at least um, as much as you, you can tolerate, right? Yeah. But leave some of those old stalks there. That's this says like eight inches at least. Yeah. If you can leave and tolerate more, that's great too, because sure. it's actually, you know, our neatness and our over gardening intervention right. is actually um, a negative in a lot of ways. So that's, that's key. And then, so that's all the nature, natural way, right? Have a patch of land where they can find what they need naturally. You can also make nests, uh, places for them, the cavity nesting birds. Oh, this is, um, this one down here is actually the queen for the queen, catching a queen bumblebee and setting her up. Um, so all of these are great too. One thing, it's a great handout on this, but if you decide to do this and make a, a bee, and I know Renee is going to have an event at the, gar at the library here yeah. to, make, to make a nest, 
um, I want you to pay really close attention to part four. Step four, maintenance and monitoring. Because if you can't just leave them and forget them and not take care of them, because that's when you'll get into disease, you'll get fungus building up, um, you'll, you'll we'll end up doing more harm than good if you make one of these and then don't know how to take care of it to keep it healthy for the bees. So step four in this pamphlet is really great. Oh, and there's also there's another hand out here. In the winter, it's a bee hibernation pot. And this is super simple because it's just a terracotta pot with some moss and straw in it. And this will give the bees a place to go and they'll go into the ground under the pot and they'll be able to overwinter safely. So that's another nice, nice thing we can all do. So there, replace the straws. Um, food, of course, that's the third thing we want to provide them. So we provided them water, habitat, and then they need food because that's why they pollinate. <laughs> that's the whole reason they're after the food. And this is a quote that Jane shared. Um, food is the most critical habitat element in which humans can help pollinators by planting native plants. Okay, that's really important. And the pollen, as you see, it gives them the amino acids, nitrogen, lipids, and then the nectar is the high sugar energy. I love the proboscis on that. See the really long nose on that one on the yellow flower? So, how can you attract bees to your garden? Because I really got into this because I'm a gardener. <laughs> I'm not an entomologist. I never really liked bees when I was growing you up. Me. <laughs> um, so, this is the ideal, all right? It's native perennials, 10 species at least, and you want to plant them in groups of six to eight. Um, you want to make sure you select ones that bloom from the beginning of the spring all the way to the end of the fall. Uh, a bunching grass too, because the grasses are important to them. A little microclimate meaning, you know, you're going to have some places that are shady and cool and other places that are nice and sunny. This is what I'm going to talk about in August, because this is a whole long lecture. <laughs> when Renee said, oh yeah, well, how do we do this? Like, uh, no, that, that's really big. But if we, if we think about it in August, um, that's when you can plan. You can plan it out, you can think it through, you can help prepare the ground where you want to put this. So what I would say is go home after this lecture and think about where could I put a patch, okay? Like a 20 by 10 uh, foot area where then we can populate with just what they need. But you can do something right now because every little bit counts and we're prime time to still put annuals out. Okay? And there's a lot of great annuals that are good for the, bee, for the native bees um, that you can do. You always want to remember right plant, right place. So, you know, think about sun and shade requirements for the plants. Uh, make sure it's close enough to, you know, water where you'll be able to water it and to keep the plant alive. You can do in ground if your soil's good. If you live where I live in Cornwall on the clay and rock, I have raised beds everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a lot of container plants. <laughs> um, so that's fine. When you think about containers, make sure you choose the right kind of container or think about the properties of different containers. Porous containers, you're gonna have to water, like a terracotta pot, that'll breathe. Make sure you water it more frequently. Plastic pots can heat up. Black metal, I have some metal pots that I really love because they look great. But if you don't have a, you really wanna make sure you put a heat loving plant into that or else it'll get too hot for certain plants to survive. And I just listed some of my easy peasy, and Marilyn's a gardener too, she can tell me if I have, I picked good ones here. To me, zinnias, I grew zinnias from seed this year. I had a bumper crop. I mean, they're so easy, they're easy to grow from seed. It might be a little late now, but you can certainly find them and they are just tough, good plants. And you know, you can take a few. If you're giving 90% of them to the bees, take the 10% and put them inside and enjoy the flowers. Dianthus I really like. That's that pink and they, it comes in a pink and then a kind of a pink and white. They're a great low. Um, they're good at edging around edges. Um, dahlias. I grew dahlias from seeds that's from seed this year too that I didn't even know was possible or the corms, but I know uh, Agway actually has a bunch of the, the corms that you would plant in the ground. Um, for dahlias and dahlia flowers are gorgeous. You always want to try with any of these plants, I should say, and I back up. The, the more natural of the species instead of the cultivars, you know, you don't want the double, the, the doubles or the triple flowers because they're all petal. There's no real flower left there. And a lot of times they don't even have nectar. 
Um, so you want to go for the more um, native, natural looking ones if you can. Salvia is a good choice and that'll bloom all summer. Um, so that's nice. And portulaca, I love, if you have a sunny spot, portulaca are easy. They're tiny, su they're succulents. So their leaves are like little pine needles, but uh, fleshy and soft, like I a succulent love leaf. I portulaca and I haven't been able to find them and they are, everybody has them this year. Yeah. I'm like, so excited. The old fashioned flowers are coming back, it seems, yeah. right? Marigolds yeah, and. Portulaca, my husband used to call them pork chops. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just, just suddenly looking at the name up there made me remind There you go. You can plant some of those. It is. They're beautiful and they're really lovely color. Other ways you can help. All right. I talked about the bead, the desert. The lawn is a desert. Has nothing there to offer. Um, so reduce it. That's what I'm saying. Find a patch of your lawn. I'm, I already picked out a patch of my lawn that I'm going to turn into a pollinator garden next year with perennials and I'm going to plan that and, and take away that bit of lawn because it's doing nobody any good. Um, and driving a lawnmower for an hour, uh, not an electric lawnmower, I'm talking about your, you know, your basic lawnmower, is the equivalent negative impact on the um, environment and air of driving a car, a non-electric car, for a hundred miles. Wow because they're dirty engines, those two stroke, they're, you know, they don't have the carburetors, they don't have the, you know, pollution collecting devices that automobiles have. They're really a negative impact on the environment lawnmowers, so less lawn. Or create a bee-friendly lawn. And I really like this, we're gonna overseed some of our lawn with white clover. I know when I was little, our home, our lawn at home always was full of white clover. And I hated it because I was always afraid of stepping on a bee. <laughs> right? You have to be like, oh, don't step on the, on the clover flowers. But they're a great food source for pollinators, for bees. So that's a good thing. And then you just mow your lawn, which is better for the lawn anyway, up and keep it at least three to four inches. Mow it at three to four inch height and you'll preserve all those lovely white flowers. Um, control invasive plants because they outcompete the native plants. So you always want to do that. And then protect any natives that you have, you know? Yes. So I have a question. I have. I mow way more than I want to, but um, I have sumac all around. Uh -huh. And it's great for I love. <laughs> well, but the bit you don't want it—it's it's coming into I mean, the lawn. I mean, yeah. Obviously, you you can cut some down, and it pops up elsewhere. And I do what I try to do is there are three sections that I'll mow like once every three weeks and I try to when I see what's growing I try to leave big patches but then mm -hmm. it means that eventually I've got to mow down yeah. like two feet of I, I know it's a it's a balance right so try where you can reduce lawn maybe put in some other perennials that are going to be really tough and hardy that can outcompete the sumac I don't know what those are off the top of my head <laughs> but I bet they're out there I bet they're out there I actually wanted to ask also I think this is an invasive thing but it's everywhere creeping Charlie oh yeah they, they, they are, yeah, those little tiny flowers. So is that good for the bees, or is there any good yeah. to them? And if not, how do you get rid of it? I, yeah, no, I know, we have it too. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just, it takes over pretty fast. Yeah, it's creepy. I think it's a, um, it's a European native too. It's, it's invasive for but sure. It's, okay. it's know, less bees. common than bishops. Yeah, well, and we could, we could go on and on about all our invasives. So protect your native plants. Try, try your best. You know. I, I'm not going to talk about lawn, I, you know, preserving lawns. Let's, that's a whole nother lecture too. I guess the other thing I wanted to ask is, you know, we have a lot of wild daisies and black-eyed Susans and stuff like that. Are they, you know, it's a different kind of flower. It's got that thing in the middle. Is that yes. good for these? Yes, very good. Yeah. Very good. Asters, yeah. any of the Rudbeckia, black-eyed Susans, the, the daisy family. Yeah, absolutely. All very good. Let them grow. Let all those natives grow. Community science, like I showed you, you know, start tracking the bees and, and, and uh, helping to provide the data because if we have that data. The other thing that was um, sad about the Vermont Bee Survey and some of the work that's been going on, there are seven um, species of bumblebees in the state that are of very high concern to um, potential, you know, conservation concern. Um, very threatened and, and may become extinct and they already think one, the, the rusty bumblebee might already be extinct in the state. So that's why we've got to get on this now and really start to help them. 
And then the last thing, reduced pesticide use. IPM, does anybody know what IPM stands for? Integrated pest Awesome, integrated pest management. It's another great thing I learned in the Master Gardener course. So, you know, we're still gonna have pests and if you have a vegetable garden like I do, you, you wanna try to save your harvest and you wanna try to save the flowers that, you, that you're growing. So we do have to think about pest management still, but this is a new way of thinking about it. And it starts with monitoring. If you really look at your plants every day, see what's coming up, because you can catch things early on. And if you catch them early on, they're gonna be easier to get rid of. The other thing is, and I've been trying to teach my husband this, is tolerate, evaluate the plant. Is that plant really being hurt or not, right? I mean, the flea beetles, they're annoying and they put that, but if you, if you get them past the early stage, the plant is going to survive. You don't have to kill every pest, even if it is causing damage, as long as it's not causing too much damage where the plant is dying, right? So, so think about that. And then if you do need to intervene, do it in a stepwise fashion. You start at the bottom of the, the pyramid here because those are the non-toxic and they're, they're intervention ways culturally, right? I've been trying this year, um, planting mixed beds. Instead of tomatoes and just tomatoes in that bed, I'm planting basil in that bed too because hornworms, tomato hornworms, don't like basil. And there's, there's other pairs. There's a great book called um, Plant Pairing and it's all based on science. Um, I'm not gonna remember the name, the, the author's name now, I'm afraid. It's a really great book, just came out this year, and it tells you which plants to plant with which other plants to either help them along because they're just good for each other, or that the one plant repels a pest that is a really uh, negative impact on that. So mixed beds are better than just planting all your tomatoes in one bed. Um, crop rotation is another one that is a cultural way of, of impacting this where, you know, if a, a bad um, pest builds up in one bed, don't plant tomatoes again and again and again in the same bed. Try to move them around if you have that uh, ability to do. Physical to traps or um, row covers, things like that that can keep bugs away is another thing to think about. Um, biological controls. And there's a company called Arabico Org Organics. They have a lot of good organic, you know, if you have to use a, a, a pesticide of some sort, there's some very um, mild ones in here. But also you can order lace wings or you can order ladybugs or praying mantis egg cases or, so you bring in predators that attack the bad bugs that we don't want that are killing and, and eating our, our crops. So that's, that's one other, piece of this integrated pest management is actually using predators, um, predator uh, bug species. And then chemical, if you do have to go to chemical, you always want to use the least deadly type of form, right? Try to always stay with the Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, neem oils, or um, insecticidal soaps, things like that. But mind you, they're still going to kill any bug they come in contact with, right? It's not gonna just kill your flea beetles or your tomato hornworm, you know, it's, it's gonna kill the pollinators. So if you have to use anything like that, you still wanna make sure you don't do it when plants are blooming. So catch it before the bloom happens in your plants and control them as best you can. You can remove the blooms so you're not, you know, you're treating the plant, take the blooms off. I know it kind of defeats the purpose depending on what kind of plant it is, if you want the fruit of that. Um, just use it where you need it. Don't do it widespread everywhere. Um, I use a little spray where if I have to put something on, I'm just putting it on those plants that are actually um, being attacked and are in danger of completely dying. Early morning uh, or evening, right? So before the bees are up and after they go to sleep and try for low heat and humidity, low heat, low humidity, um, low wind days, right? Because then the wind, especially, that's gonna disperse things, right? And then it's just gonna land everywhere and really um, be negative on all of the, all of those. Yes. The only thing that I have to spray, I try to do everything without using any Because you're right, most of the time, the bug isn't gonna destroy the plant, you'll still get some food. Cucumber meals. Yeah. I can't keep up with them with my hands, spraying with soap, I still can't keep them back. Yeah. Um, 
uh, two tricks I've heard. I haven't tried this yet. I haven't planted my cucumbers yet. Um, if you start later, start them inside. They're not great at being transplanted. I mean, that's why you usually want to put them in if you do them in the, the pots that will dissolve because then they'll be stronger once they're out there, right? So they can beat and grow beyond where they're going to get killed and damaged. <coughs> Row covers. But um, cucumber beetles, you'd have to go to a new bed because I'm 80% sure they overwinter. I think they go in the woods to overwinter sometimes. All right, yeah. <laughs> so so row covers, if, if, if you're sure they're not in the soil, you could always put a row cover, cover over them. And then once the plants get established, they're usually okay. And you know what? Pick them off. I know. It's, I know. I know. But I have too many. You know, I have a lot yeah. Of them. I know. Well, that's why, that's why, you know, if you have to use something, just do it as sensibly as you can if you really need it and only do it when you need to. We're, we're overpicking the easy things, the, pota the potato. The hornworms. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. The potatoes, yeah. Oh, the potato. Oh, the potato beetle. beetle. Yeah, I the Colorado beetle. potato beetle. I'm squishing up and down the row every day, but I won't have time for the cucumber beetles. <laughs> they can fly away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the problem. Okay, one last thing. Have fun. Enjoy. Embrace loving bees. Um, here's some really cute websites. Uh, the Bee Lab. Uh, University of Minnesota and remember Minnesota it's the same climate it's the same land formation it's the same things that grow there grow here it's considered Laurentian forest so very similar so anything you you, you get from uh, University of Minnesota it's very applicable to here they did something so cute if you have kids or grandkids that you want to get and share this with a pollinator yearbook where it was like um, who's most likely to be Queen Bee? Who's most likely to dance the night away? And they, they have a little profile of a different bee on each page in this yearbook. So quite cute for kids. Um, Beescape, really cool. Beescape.org. It has a map. And that is my property. So I zeroed down on the map to find my property. And you can find out how good that area is for bees. So they've taken into account, like, is there, are there good nesting sites? Um, has there been insecticide use? Um, is there good floral or good food sources for them? And there's a little um, map uh, um, uh, guide there uh, to tell you which patches are better. And then you can click on this. And actually, the insecticide is at 52. It's a score, and they go into all, you can read all about the uh, methodology for it. That was actually low, so it's good. You know, it hasn't you been farmland. Well. I'm sorry. You scored well. I talking? scored okay. It scored okay. okay. I still need some more. I still need some more um, fall floral. <laughs> need need some fall blooming stuff. Um, and the pollinator uh, pollinator.org. If you go to any website, go to that one because it's absolutely fabulous. Really, really cool stuff. It's where the posters from. You don't have to write it down because it's on any of the brochures that you picked up. Um, and pollinator week, third week of June. They're doing a pollinator party. <laughs> it's the coolest thing. So they're going to have different um, talks each day. And you can uh, order a t-shirt and you can order a, a party box. And it's got like um, recipes that are pollinator friendly and all this sorts of stuff. So really good organization. Very, very cute. And oh yeah, I actually have this. This is just, you can download it for free. Pollinator friendly cooking. So <laughs> very cute little book. Um, and that is it. I did want to say just one thing. Uh, thanks to Middlebury Garden Club, who is sponsored my uh, tuition for the, master, the Extension Master Gardener. So put a plug in for that great organization. Marilyn's our president. Um, and then the Extension Master Gardener, uh, really great organization. And there's lots of, if you ever have a question, you can ask a Master Gardener on the website. Um, and there's other good resources there as well. So I would check that out if you haven't already. I would say thank you to Andrea. That was such a wonderful program. It was whirlwind. Sorry, I didn't mean to go that fast, but I knew we had gotten a late start. So before you all pack up and go, I just want to tag on to Pollinator Week a couple of things that are happening here at the library. Uh, there is going to be a take and make. If you're familiar with what we did last summer when we couldn't have people in the building, we had. They're basically craft kits. You come in, you pick up a bag, and everything you need is in there. So there is going to be a take and make in the beginning of June for a bee hotel. It is not a beautiful, substantial, permanent one like the ones that we saw, but it'll give you an idea. It'll give you a taste of what to do. It'll be fun to make, and you can see how it goes. 
Also, uh, during Pollinator Week, I'll be doing a program right here again talking about a citizen science program mm -hmm. called um, Observing Pollinators. So if you want to sign up for that, uh, the registration should be out with our next newsletter. And I'll be here talking to you about how to use the application on your smartphone, iNaturalist, how to get involved with this citizen, citizen science initiative. And also the library has, uh, it's called the Observing Pollinators Kit. So you can check it out for a week. It's in a canvas bag. It's everything you need. It's binoculars, it's stopwatches, it's a how-to. It's all the instructions on how to report your data. There's four little clipboards in there with data sheets so you can do it with your family or your grandchildren. And then you can take your sheets, data sheets home and become part of the world of citizen science. So those are all things to look forward to coming up. I won't keep you in this heat any longer. Yes. Check the website, check the newsletter, and you can get all the information for what I just said. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your interest. What was your last name? Lambs.